rise if you're able for the call to worship. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. And as we praise this God, let's sing um, from our, our hymnal, which is written in the bulletin, Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, O my soul. Father, thank you for bringing us all here together, both in person and through the live stream service. Father, you call us to set aside one day out of seven as a day of rest. And Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we realize just how much we, we need this rest. Throughout the week, we are so often distracted and focused on the everyday cares of life. But Father, you call us back to look to you, to look to you, our Savior, our Lord. Father, thank you for this opportunity to come before you, to leave all us behind and to look to you, to praise you, to admire your glory, and to rest in your presence. Father, we ask that the next hour would be glorifying to you, that our acts of worship would bring you true glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I've got a friend of mine who um, used to work on Capitol Hill in the office of a congressman, and one time they were um, talking about a particular course of action that they were going to take. And uh, my friend, you know, who's a, who's a Christian, um, this didn't jive with what they had ta talked about of them being their principles that they believed in. And he said, well, he, goes, he, he said, what, but what about our principles? And, um, and the chief of staff said to him, well, you know, sometimes you have to rise above your principles. It's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? Um, I, I think that though most people make calculations like that, sure, there are principles, and, and I'm glad to abide by them. 
as long as they give me the outcome that's advantageous to me. I, I think that's why the law is summed up, Jesus said, um, in not only to love the Lord your God, but to love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes I hear people talking about, you know, we need to learn to love ourselves. Friends, we love ourselves tremendously well. We look for our own advantage. And the kingdom to which you are called tells you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let me read you those portions of what God says regarding how we're to love our neighbor. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And you say, well, how's that loving my neighbor? On it, he continues, you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your servants, nor your animals, nor the alien among you, so that those who serve you may rest as you do. Remember that you were once in bondage and that the Lord your God redeemed you with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or set your desire in your neighbor's house or land, his servants, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. As a congregation, let's read together this prayer of confession from Philippians chapter 2. Lord God, help me to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility count others more significant than myself. Help me to love my neighbor as I now love and cherish myself, that my life would change so that I no longer look for my own interests, but also for the interests of others. Give me the mind of Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but took the form of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You, Father, therefore have highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Grant that those bowing knees and confessing tongues would begin with mine today. Amen. Take a moment to seek God, to confess your own faults and failings, and loving your neighbor as yourself and seeking his grace because he abundantly promises it. The psalmist writes, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. 
His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And I hope today that through Jesus Christ, you have seen the salvation of God. This morning, instead of a responsive reading, I'll be reading Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Amen. We're able to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord uh, in the offering plates in the back on the way in or on the way out or via the website for those of you who are joining us via live stream. But you know, God doesn't just want our stuff. That stuff is really just representative of us offering our lives to him. And so we take this time in our service and normal times it would be go together with the act of making our offering right then, but uh, nonetheless, it's important that we take this time to offer ourselves to God. And so as we prepare to do that, to offer ourselves to God, me, for me to encourage you to offer yourselves to God in this time, in service to Him, and love for Him, and commitment to Him, Remember the word of God when it says, through Christ, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Let's take a moment to offer ourselves to God.
eyes if you're able to. Father, all that we have and all that we are is a gift from you. You have created us and every good and perfect gift comes down from you, the Father of lights in whom there is no shifting shadow. And so our God, we give ourselves to you today through Jesus Christ. And Lord, the things that you have entrusted us with as we give them to you. We pray, our Father, that you would use them to glorify the name of your Son. Give to us through them opportunity to help others and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. And now, as we confess our faith, let us confess reading the words from 1 Timothy chapter 3 that are written in the bulletin. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. God appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now go to our God in prayer. Father in heaven, as we enter into your presence as a congregation, we hallow your name this morning. For as you spoke by your prophet Isaiah so long ago, I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. And Father, you made this declaration of sovereignty in the context of working through King Cyrus, the leader of Persia, and a man who had not acknowledged you or your sovereignty. But Cyrus was a man nonetheless whose right hand you promised to take hold of, to subdue nations before him, and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates would not be shut. You said you would strengthen this king, Cyrus, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people would know there is none besides you. Father, throughout history, your servants have so often struggled to believe in faith that you are sovereign, for we so often see the wicked triumph like King Cyrus. And we confess that even today we have this conception that if you were truly sovereign, then the righteous would be in power on this earth. Especially during the course of this most recent presidential election, we, Father, have so easily despaired that whoever ultimately triumphed righteousness would suffer. Yet, Father, you have so clearly directed us not to view the events in this world as a proxy for your power. Jesus himself, in his trial before Pilate, told that potentate that my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. So, Father, this morning, we pray as you have taught us for all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Though we know not why exactly you have raised up the leaders you have in this country, we lift them up in prayer, asking for your mercy on the policies they implement and for their own salvation. We specifically pray for President Trump and former Vice President Biden that these men would administer true justice 
and that you would bring them and members of their teams to a personal relationship with you. And Father, as we pray this, we do so not in a spirit of despair or despondency or resignation, but with a more accurate view in light of your word towards your sovereignty. For truly, you, our God, are in the heavens. You do all that you please. You form the light and create darkness. You bring prosperity and create disaster. You, the Lord, do all these things. Father, as we pray for this, we pray that more would be called to your kingdom of heaven. We lift up this morning those who so faithfully witness your goodness and your love in other lands. In Karamoja, Uganda, we thank you for the work of Tina Jong, this missionary who is using her own resources to witness of your goodness and to support your saints in, in other lands. Father, thank you for her past work in Asia and for the successful trip that she's had to Uganda. Be with her as she acclimates to this new country and begins learning the Karamojan language. And Father, we lift up the Karamojan people as well. We have so often prayed for our missionaries who work in their midst, but we ask this morning that you would work through your believers there to raise up faithful leaders among this community. Help the Karamojan Christians to be a beacon of light for you, both in their country and elsewhere around the world. Here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Father, we rejoice with Pastor Keller and the church there for how you have blessed their congregation with new attendees and growth in Bible study groups. Continue to build them up and give them the elders and the, the physical infrastructure that they need to support this growth. We continue to pray for this congregation, including our members who are away at college, that we would have opportunities and the boldness to witness to those around us. In these times darkened by disease and political and civil strife, especially as so many are seeking peace, give us, we ask, the opportunities and the skill to answer with gentleness and respect the reason for the hope that we have. We pray as well for those in our congregation and communities who are new to the faith, that you would strengthen their hearts and deepen their faith. Protect them, we ask, and let no one steal away the seed of the gospel that has been planted in their lives. Father, we bring before you as well our physical needs and concerns. We pray for Laura that she would be recovered to full health and that her doctors would have insight as they try to make a good diagnosis. For Emily, that her medical team would be able to adjust her medications and that she would no longer suffer from the facial numbness that she is experiencing after the recent surgery. For Lally, that she would continue to recover from a broken hip. And for Rose, that she would especially feel your presence and comfort and peace right now. We thank you for restoring Wade and Emily's family to full health and for bringing physical healing to Brandon. We also thank you for a good diagnosis for Donna. Father, we thank you for those who serve this congregation and others who join us through the live stream service. For Vinnie Bland, as he manages the sound team, as well as for the volunteers for this effort. And for Julie Blackburn, who helps make the sermons available online. Continue to bless their work that through their efforts, your truth and love and goodness would shine through. We also continue to pray for those who live around this church and are planning to sell their property to a developer, that you would work through these events to bring more to you. Be especially with Glenn, that he would have wisdom in representing the church in this endeavor. Father, we also bring before you those requests that have been unexpressed. We know that in this congregation and in our communities and around the world, there are believers who are suffering from physical ailments and mental distress, from financial pressures, from spiritual drought. Though we not, know not all of these concerns, Father, you do. You know our needs even before we can ask. And so we pray this morning that your hand would be on these brothers and sisters of ours that you would answer their immediate needs and use these events in their lives to increase their faith in you and to bring glory to your name. 
Father, our Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples shortly before he entered that garden where he was to be betrayed that peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. But Father, in those hours that followed, we can only imagine how dissonant that promise must have seemed, that statement of Jesus's, that peace I leave with you. For in their hearts, we can imagine that the disciples felt anything but peace as one of their own betrayed Jesus in front of their eyes, as their Lord was led away and as he was ultimately condemned and nailed to a tree. Yet your word was true. For you did give them peace, a type of peace that they probably could not even have imagined when they were in that garden, a type of peace that would strengthen and sustain them through the years ahead against horrendous travails, for they knew that their reward was not on this earth. And Father, your promise remains true today, for you give a peace to us, not as the world gives, for the peace that comes from you transcends all understanding. And so, Father, this morning as we come before you, we do so with joy and with hopeful expectation. For truly our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We approach your name this morning, Father, in his name, praying as he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we prepare to hear God's word, let's sing, From out of the depths I cry, O Lord, to thee. be seated. I've got an extra six feet of property that runs along my backyard, and it's, it's really come in handy back in the Back corner, we've got a nice little shaded mulch seating area that uh, various times of the year we can sit back there. And my wife's got some uh, nice um, thorn, um, rose bushes along the, uh, along the fence there that, uh, that, that she takes care of. And, uh, and it's really come in handy. And now, I say they're an extra six feet. How we got that extra six feet is an interesting story about... 16 years ago, my next door neighbor um, was going to get a dog, and so he wanted to put a fence in. So he told me he was going to put the fence, and I said, that's fine. And I was away at work. When I came uh, home, the fence was in, and he came over to talk to me, and he said, hey, he said, I, he said, I got to tell you, he said, um, 
he said when the, when, when the fella came to put in the fence, he had a hard time figuring out where the property line was. There were, there were two things that might have been the property line. And I said to him, um, listen, I said, um, take the line that you think is closest to my house and then set the fence in six feet off of that so that there's no uh, dispute. And, um, and so it's kind of a win-win because my neighbor hates yard work. So he's got, he's got six feet less of yard work and we've got this nice little uh, seating area and uh, nice places for uh, rose bushes and things like that. And, and I'm thankful for that extra space. We've had it for 16 years now. Um, I know that it's not mine, but I'm thankful for it while we have it. Apostle Paul has been uh, talking to the church at Corinth, and these are people um, to whom he had brought the gospel. And he's got some confidence, really a, a hopeful confidence, that their eyes have been opened to the kingdom of God, that they've really come to know Christ but he's concerned for them, and he's concerned for them because they've shut their eyes to the kingdom, and they're, and they're living like people who haven't been renewed by the Spirit of God. And he deals with some things that uh, seem pretty mundane to us, but they're important. And this is what he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you were to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to your shame. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers, but instead one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers? The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you've been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And Father, as we think of ourselves, this is what some of us were. But we were washed, we were sanctified, we were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, filled with your Holy Spirit. Father, grant to us the hope that Paul had for the Corinthians, that we live like it. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. I think we've all heard those frustrating cases, you know, where, where something happens and the outcome is legally correct, but it's morally wrong. Um, cases, for example, you might think of somebody who through uh, charm and smooth talk got somebody to sign a contract, the provisions of which no person in his right mind would sign if he had actually read it, but now it's binding. Throughout this letter, uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul's concern for the church has been that while they're Christians and while they profess to be Christians, they've been 
acting in a way that's worldly. They're acting like people unchanged by the Spirit of God. They're living in blind ignorance to the kingdom of God. And as we come to chapter 6, as it's been divided up in our Bibles, now they're living by their culture's definition of justice rather than the kingdom's definition of justice. And they might have argued, you know, but, but what we're doing is legal. We're allowed to do this. But friends, that's not the way it works. Do you know that um, as a U.S. citizen, you are bound by U.S. law if you travel abroad? Did you know that? That, uh, that something that's illegal for you to do here but is legal to do there is illegal for you to do there if you're a U.S. citizen. You are bound by the laws of the citizenship that you have. It's the same for the kingdom of God. And while we're not told specifically what their issues were here, it's uh, something that was reported to Paul. Remember at the beginning of this letter, he said that somebody from Chloe's house has come and they've reported all kinds of things that are happening there that concern me. Whatever it was, it must have involved property or contracts or something that the courts in Corinth would have entertained listening to. And the whole question that Paul raises for them here is a question of the competency to judge. That competency is a kingdom question. And he writes this, if any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, my Bible says a point judges uh, as judges even men of little account in the church i think that the king james says that too there's an alternate translation i actually think it's a better translation it's a question do you appoint as judges those who are of no account in the church paul says i say this to your shame is it possible that there is no one among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers, but instead one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. You see the divisions in the church that we'd heard about, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos, that run very deep. We saw earlier in chapter 5 that the Corinthians had confuse kingdom grace with its carnal counterpart. That is, that they thought that accepting egregious immorality within the church was a way of showing grace, when it in fact showed the opposite. And Paul had previously told them, we find that they were not to have regular interaction just kind of common interaction with immoral people. For some reason, they'd gotten the idea that that meant the people of the world, that they were supposed to harshly judge the people of the world. But they could wink at sin inside the church. They're one of us. It's okay what they do. It's the exact opposite conclusion that they should have drawn. And it showed that they were living with their eyes shut to the kingdom of God. In chapter 5, verse 12, Paul had said, What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? What Paul's saying is that it's not the place of Christians to hold people outside of the church to kingdom standards. They don't belong to that kingdom. It is the place of Christian people to hold those within the church to kingdom standards because they claim to be citizens of that kingdom. But what Paul says next is that just as Christians 
are not competent to judge those outside the church. Those outside the church are not competent to settle disputes among believers. And the reason is simply this, that no matter how formally good and upright the judge may be, no matter how much integrity they may have, the judges of this world operate by a different set of standards than the kingdom of God does. Let me give you an example of that, not from the uh, legal realm, but from, an, but from another realm where you see that there's a difference in the standards by which things operate. I have a friend of mine who's an uh, elder at an, uh, another church, and uh, he also has worked in HR and human resources. And for a while when he was working in human resources, one of the things that he did was uh, conflict resolution in the workplace. And I said to him, oh, I said, that's, uh, well, that's, that's a kind of a, a neat thing to do. I said, I, that must really help you, uh, being an elder in the church and knowing the Bible, uh, because the Bible has to say a lot about reconciliation. And I said, so that must be very helpful. He said, no, it's no help at all. I said, really? He said, yeah, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, if, if somebody in the church were to do something that was wrong, that was, a, that was a sin, that was wrong, whether it was against you or someone else, what would you do? What would be the thing that you were supposed to do? And I said, well, I would, I would go and see them, just the two of us, right? He said, right. He said, that's the exact thing in the business world that you are not supposed to do. He said, that seems confrontational. That seems... Um, um, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking at? I guess confrontational is the, the word that I'm looking for. And uh, he said, so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to come to HR. And then HR will bring the complaint to the person because if they know who the person is who brought the complaint, that might impinge on the working relationship. That might make this person seek retaliation. Now, it's all that is to simply say is that there's two different standards by which these spheres operate. And he's right. You can't expect the world to act like the church. <laughs> the sad thing at Corinth is that the church was not acting like the church. They were bringing their disputes before judges who operated by a different set of standards than the kingdom that they belonged to. Eyes that are closed to the kingdom of God see justice differently than those whose eyes are open to it. And the standards of the kingdom and the standards of this world, even when those worldly standards are formally good, they make sense in the system in which you find them. They're different standards. And it, it, it prompts the question to the Corinthians, prompts the question to us, to you and to me, what standard of justice do you live by? And Paul says to them, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. What the Corinthians were doing was perfectly legal. Is that the standard that the church is to live by? Many years ago, I helped out a church. One of their deacons had gotten himself into some trouble, making some bad investments. He was investing in lottery tickets. Um, and, he was, and he was really hoping that he would be able to, you know, buy this, get out from under some crushing debt. Listen, friends, this isn't about that, but uh, don't, don't invest in lottery tickets. <laughs> a bad investment. I said, you know, I said to somebody one time, I said, you know, if I ever 
win the lottery. I'm gonna, he said, I didn't know you played the lottery. I said, I don't play the lottery, but if you calculate the odds, my chances of finding the winning lottery ticket on the sidewalk is about the same as my buying one, right? So it's possible. And um, didn't go well. We were never able to convince him that we were trying to help him. He just thought we were trying to condemn him. And, and he kept saying very defensively, buying lottery tickets is perfectly legal. I would never break the law. That's great. We shouldn't break the law. Is that the mere standard we should live by? Who lost the lawsuits at Corinth? You know who did? They did. Paul says the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you've been completely defeated already. It's not that there is never disputes among believers. It's that the place for them to be settled is in the church and to be bound by the decisions there because the church is operating according to the standards of the kingdom. You know, it's interesting, in the years that I've been a part of our presbytery, we've had a few, and I'm glad to say only a very few, formal trials where complaints or charges have been brought against ministers. And uh, one of the elders in our presbytery is also an attorney, and he remarked one time, the last time we had such a trial, he he, he remarked how different what happened in the church was than was so in worldly uh, suits of law, whether they're civil or criminal prosecution. And I said, how so? And he said, well, he said in, in, in civil suits or even in criminal suits, really, he said, what both sides are supremely interested in is winning. He said, but, but in the presbytery, it's very interesting. He said, both sides are interested at getting at the truth. They're interested in righteousness. Both sides are interested in there being repentance where there needs to be repentance, restoration where there needs to be restoration and reconciliation. And he said it's very different. Of course it's different. It operates according to a different standard. And this is what was missed at Corinth. Eyes that are closed to the kingdom of God see justice differently than eyes that are open to it. The standards of the kingdom and the standards of the world, e even those worldly standards which are formally good and internally consistent, are different standards. And it's because of that that Paul expressed to the church at Corinth a concern and a hope. And it's, and it's at the end of this section, you know, he's been, he's been talking about um, their divisions. He's been uh, talking to them about the immorality that they have accepted. And now he talks to them about lawsuits. And he sums this up here, this section that he's been talking about. He says, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. And, and Paul lists a whole bunch of things that I think most people probably in popular culture would probably say, oh yeah, well I could see how that would keep somebody from the kingdom of God. And, and then he mentions something that I think that most people wouldn't think about. He mentions Greed. Greed. Which is behind the issue of these suits. The Corinthians were living with their eyes shut to the kingdom of God. They were living, Paul had said elsewhere, like worldly people, like people unchanged by the Spirit. And Paul's concern is this, that despite what faith they claim, 
they really have no real faith if they live this way. You know, uh, yesterday when I was driving somewhere, I put the radio on and listened to, listened to preaching on the radio sometimes, and I heard a preacher say, and it was a great statement. He said, faith is not found in your feelings. Faith is found in your feet. You get what that means? That we express our faith by what we do, not by how we feel, but by what we do. And so Paul lists several egregious sins, but, but among them, he lists these things that people would say, well, well, these aren't very egregious, agreed. You know, but they're the things that led to the lawsuits. And, and, and Paul says, don't be deceived. Those who live this way are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Now he's got a hope as well for them. He says, that's what some of you were. You were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Is it possible for those who are really Christians to behave badly sometimes? It, it is. Ask my wife. Is it, is it possible for those who are followers of Jesus to be blind to the kingdom at times? But, but don't be deceived. Those who repeatedly, persistently, unrepentantly live this way will not inherit the kingdom of God. I've got a friend in another state. He bought a piece of property and had a house built. There were already houses behind theirs. When the house was uh, being built, there was a kind of a wooded area between them, and some of that wooded area was cleared and um, while the house was being built, the neighbor cleared area from the back, and he put in a put in a pool and had it fenced in. And when he moved in, this uh, fella, um, the, well, the neighbor invited him over, and they became really good friends. And they would hang out in the summers at the pool. In the course of time, these two families found themselves at the same church. They went to the same church. Um, when the man who bought the property and uh, had the house built went to sell that house, um, the realtor said, we've got, a, we've got a bit of a problem. He said, your, um, your, your neighbor's fence extends 10 feet onto your property. <laughs> and uh, he said, it's going to make it uh, hard to sell the house. And, uh, and, and so this man went to talk to his neighbor that he'd known that they hung out together, went to church together, and his neighbor said, yeah, well, it's my property now. And, um, and, and he directed him to, a, to that state's squatter's rights laws that because he'd uh, been on that property for a, a while, he said, I have a right to this property. Yeah, interestingly, he actually didn't because... In a lot of squatters' rights laws, the person has to know that you're occupying their property. And he didn't. Do you know that Virginia has squatters' rights laws? Did you know that? If you occupy a piece of property continuously for 15 years, if you maintain and improve that property and you, you do it in full knowledge of the person whose property it was, you have rights to it. So that six feet that I told you about, that's mine, according to the law. But if my neighbor ever wants it back, he can have it. And the reason is that I'm bound by a law that has stricter requirements. And there's a principle, I know it's not exactly the same, but there's a principle in Deuteronomy 27, 17 that pronounced that man cursed who moves his neighbor's boundary marker. 
Yeah, you know, I don't know how much longer I'll be in that house. It'd be nice if I was there for 25 years more. That would be great. I'd love that. But I want to tell you, friends, that 40 years of an extra six feet of property is not worth my inheritance in the kingdom of God. But what if you really are wrong? What if there really is an injustice against you and, and, the, and the church hasn't gotten it right? It's possible for the church to make a mistake. Paul answers that question. He says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your brothers. You know, the truth of the matter is that at times, God brings about his justice through human injustice. Can I prove that to you? Listen to this from Isaiah 53. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. And for the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Was that fair? But eyes that are open to the kingdom of God perceive justice differently. Father, open our eyes to the kingdom of God. And Father, help us to perceive not only justice, but all of these contrasts that you show us in this book differently. Lord, you've made us citizens of the kingdom. We're bound by the rules, by the laws, by the ethos of that kingdom. Father, it's a, it's a kingdom that will not pass away, a kingdom that will have forever, and a kingdom whose citizens, the citizens of which we are, open our eyes to it, help us to live like it, through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. As we conclude our worship, if you're uh, able to rise, and we'll sing together, the Lord will come and not be slow. Thank you.
to uh, join us this evening at 7 o'clock for uh, the Sunday school class. Uh, uh, anybody could really attend it, uh, but probably be the most beneficial to uh, teens through adults on uh, being able to read the Bible profitably and some of the, 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 uh, the things to be aware of as we seek to do that. And I pray that this week your eyes will uh, remain open to the kingdom of God, that you'll live in the light of it. You know, the, the, the kingdoms of the earth, they wax and they wane, uh, rulers rise, rulers fall, and none of it has the least bit of bearing on the kingdom that God has established in Christ, save but what he wants to accomplish through it. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.